<laughs> okay. Well, there's always, if you've ever seen Voices of Color, you know that I always have uh, tech issues. This is not abnormal. Um, luckily, this, this, I don't want to say class, this really is meant to be a discussion. Um, for some of you, you may have seen the See Something, Do Something bystander intervention, and we will touch on that. But doing this over the years, I realized that we need to have a stronger foundation for learning the tools that are necessary to address and interrupt harmful behaviors, how to help people who have been harmed, and how to be present in the learning opportunities, such as how to bring people alongside versus kind of the call out culture that I get a lot of, um, we get a lot of resistance to, and, and we'll talk about that too. But just so I have creds out there, so people don't have uh, any concerns about this, because talking about some of this can be traumatic, especially when we talk about bystander intervention and microaggressions. Um, I do want to give just a little bit of background. I, uh, for the SCA, I was on the first on-tier DEI council, and then I was interim chair for the next iteration of it. Uh, some of you may know me from my podcast show, Voices of Color, Skating and Stories. And really, this talk today comes out of the experiences that I had as a facilitator and what I learned. Um, I'm looking out and I'm seeing, you know, some of the folks who were on Voices of Color here in this room, which just uh, makes my heart happy. Um, and there's so much that I learned. So I, I'm bringing some of that with me here today. Mundanely, I'm a licensed professional counselor. I work in forensic psychiatry or forensic psychology training in trauma, extensive training in DEI, and really focused on the intersection of health equity and mental health. And so a lot of what I do is trauma-informed. We've started moving away from that to say resilience and healing because uh, for many reasons, the term trauma-informed can be trauma-inducing. Um, and there are a couple of I don't, I hate to say ground rules because really what I want out of this is to be a brave space. Um, and a brave space really is, hey, I'm here. I may not know everything. So it's practicing some humility and I'm gonna take this opportunity to learn and grow. The way that we learn and grow is being an active participant, whether you make a mistake or not. Um, I actually, and I'll talk a little bit about this. I make mistakes all the day all the time. And I've been doing this for years and years and years. That is how we grow and learn. Um, so for this, I really want folks to be present with a growth mindset. So again, make mistakes. That's okay. That's what it is here for. That's why I am here. That's what I'm hoping others are here for. Um, we do want to ouch and educate. And when I mean ouch and educate, if someone says something that feels, you know, it's not sitting right, or it's like, oh, uh, that kind of hurts, that's harm, ouch and educate. And what I mean is saying, hey, I heard you use this term. I'm not sure what you meant for it. When we use this term, this is what it feels like. Uh, that's part of the bringing along is to not just be like, you're being dumb or you're being an ass, excuse my language, this is what happens when I teach, um, but that you bring someone along with the education piece as well. Now, there are caveats for that. As people from marginalized communities, it's not always our job and it shouldn't always be our job. I happen to be in a position where my entire career has been the ouch and educate person. And so I'm perfectly comfortable doing so and will you know, model that at times. We want to have patience for viewpoints that are not our own. I can't stress enough that everyone in this room is in a different part of their journey. And that is okay. In my mundane work and in the SCA, I work with people all the way from out and out Nazis at, through my mundane work, all the way to people who are doing the work alongside me. There is no wrong path, there's only a path. Um, we do practice, uh, you know, 
I want to assume good intent, but impact is more important. And it always has been to me. I assume that most people have good intent. I assume that most of the people in this class right now um, want to do better and that's why they're here. And we still need to center the impact because that can have lasting trauma. Lean into discomfort. So these conversations can be difficult. I'm hoping today is not. I'm hoping that we can all uh, you know, share the space together because the SE is a microcosm of a larger society. Everything that we're talking about in this class can easily be uh, generalized to our home lives, our work life balances, ex and the workplace especially. You know, these are things that are everywhere. So it's not just uh, here in the SEA, this is important. This is for everyone. So I want to start with a couple of premises because I think this is really important. When we are in these groups, we tend to come into these spaces as we are, we live in this non-binary good or evil. If you make a mistake, you're evil. If you don't, you're good. If you, uh, you know, uh, make certain microaggressions, then you're a bad person. And we need to get over this notion. And I'll talk about why because bias is inherent in who we are and there are multiple reasons for that. But I want folks to just come in and drop the good, bad binary with the caveat that there are times that harmful situations are absolutely bad. We think about these big situations such as, you know, I went to Ontario West War and at some point someone drew a giant swastika in the Biffy. Yeah, that felt really shitty. My guess was it wasn't someone with, you know, good intent and ignorance. And that tends not to be what happens on a daily basis. We think of these big events and that is not what we see. We see microaggressions and oftentimes people don't even know that they're committing them. I do them all the time. Um, we want to give people grace. And then I say, Okay, you've had a couple of chances, you've been educated. Now we're talking about this is someone who maybe doesn't want to learn or someone who is not ready to learn and I may need to write them out of my life. And that happens. But biases are pervasive. They're not always aligned with our conscious values either. And so we may make a mistake and go, oh, that's not me. I would never do anything like that. We did. It's a mistake. It doesn't align with my view, value, beliefs, but it happened because biases, again, are pervasive and they are automatic processes. And I'll talk a little bit about the brain. And the reason I talk a little bit about the brain and the um, dynamics that happen behind biases is because then people can start to unpack and notice what is happening as we are traveling our journeys down to this place of whether you want to call it self-actualization, I call it cultural humility. It's important to know what is happening as we're doing this. We can absolutely unlearn our biases, absolutely hands down. It takes active and deliberate work. It is not an overnight thing. There's never going to be, and you're never going to hear, at least for me, that, hey, you can go take this class and you're good to go. Constant learning. I think about when over the years, I'll say, I'll give it for, for, for example, over the years, the terms that we use under the queer umbrella. So when I started working, it was LGBTQ. You were lesbian, bi, queer, transgender. And that was kind of it. And now, you know, I've added on two spirit, intersex, a whole litany of other terms as people are identifying who they are and what fits for themselves. Language changes. If you were in the previous class, I talked about, I can give you this advice and it changes all the time. Additionally, there are not black and white answers. If you came here to, to find the concrete if you do this, you will be successful. You're going to be sorely disappointed. And I apologize ahead of time because life isn't 
black and white. Life is not concrete. Uh, we're dealing with other human beings. Um, I want to make sure that if there are any questions about this, because this is really the foundational knowledge for creating change, that please put them in the chat. Um, and uh, Ducky, Dustin, whoever wants to read them, you know, feel free to interrupt and do so. Because if we if we have questions about anything that I've just said, we may get held up in the rest, and I don't want that to happen. Well, Kalara did have a question. Uh, she asked, uh, do some people get a shot of dopamine from provoking a response and some other people though? Like, are some people really that kind of adrenaline junkie where they're seeking a response by making these sorts of comments? Oh, for sure. So as, and I'm going to take off my SEA persona, put on my professional persona. There are folks who manipulate or try to manipulate or try to get a rise out of folks. I don't like the term manipulation, but there, every behavior we have has a purpose. Whether the purpose is to make someone else feel uncomfortable, whether it's to get something or to get out of something, all behavior has a purpose. Can I say, oh, that person intentionally did it to get a rise because that creates dopamine and their system is feeling pleasure right now? I can't. Because I'm not <laughs> able to see that without, you know, going through some testing. But every behavior has a reason. In the world of DEI, oftentimes when I face resistance, I look for that reason. Is it because someone is uncomfortable and the only way that they know how to act is by making jokes that piss off everybody else around them? Is it that they truly are ignorant and were raised in a certain culture and now they're here? Is it that they like other people suffering or feeling uncomfortable or what have you? It's possible. I'm not going to say it's not. Um, and we're not always going to know. And that's why when I talk about calling alongside, we talk about that, hey, here's the harm that happened. <clears throat> here's why it's harmful. And here's how you could do better in the future to kind of gauge that. Um I'm also not above when I see harmful behavior and someone's trying to get a rise to asking someone, what is it you're looking for from me? Are you looking for me to have a reaction? Are you looking for me to get upset? Because I'm not sure what the purpose of this conversation is. Um, you can ask, and we'll talk about that with some of the bystander intervention uh, tools to get to that. So it's, again, not a black and white answer, but absolutely there are folks who have maybe not <laughs> the best motives for doing this, uh, for interacting. Um, I So we have the non-binary good, non-binary bad, but I also wanted to talk about being anti-racist, being non-racist. So if you happen to be in the, cl the class previous to this with Zara and Gianna, um, they talked about being racist, being anti-racist. So I do want to note that one, part of the reason we look at race forward is if you look at the history of the United States, racial discrimination, racial targeting, um, racial genocide was here from the very beginning. Um, there's also the, the notion of, I can't hide my race. I am a queer black woman who is the daughter of an immigrant, um, and invisible and visible disabilities, some from birth, some that I've acquired. I can hide most of that. I cannot and will not ever be able to hide my skin. Um, and it's sad to think that there are people out there bleaching their skin because of the atrocities that they've faced as being a person of color. Statistically across the United States, the most prevalent uh, experience of bias that have been reported in many, many agencies across the nation have been due to race because it is one of the more obvious ones. Now, when we start talking about ethnicity, eth ethnicity that can change because people tend to think of well you're a person of color you're going to look like me and that's not the case but it is the most prevalent it is often the first thing someone sees about us 
it is often the first thing that people see when they start and their brain starts processing, is this person a threat or not? Um, and so we talk about race forward. That is not to say that we don't address everything because if you've heard the saying, uh, rising tides raise, raises all boats, by addressing racism, by addressing um, you know, oppression of racism, by addressing all of this, other groups of marginalized folks will benefit too because it's not just uh, we're focusing on race. There's also many intersections. I just listed off my identity. Um, there are many other intersections that are uplifted as we talk about race. And those principles and those changes generalize down to other areas where we have a good foundation for looking at the systemic oppression due to race that has been long prevalent in our society, starting with the genocide of Native American people, First Nations, sorry, in, or, I live in Oregon, I should say, and we say uh, Native American tribal communities, Alaskan Natives, um, and that is not widely accepted across the, uh, the nation, across the world. But starting with that, it, we moved on to slavery, and we saw the uh, you know, mass incarceration and mass um, uh, camps that developed. And so I want to be very clear that when we're talking about, when we're talking about a lot of this work, you may hear me say race forward, and that is why. It is not to discount anything else. I'm disabled. I want to see disability rights. I want to see the SCA became, become more disabled as well. And we want to make sure that we are looking at some of the historical harm that has been caused. I also wanted to make a comment, um, and this came up. I took a took a little note from the last class about anti-racism versus not racist. When we're talking about any type of DEI work, there is anti and there is not. And so someone who is not racist, not homophobic, not transphobic, is someone who doesn't do anything. When I think of not, we talk about the dead person's test. I learned that in psych. If a dead person can do it, it is not a behavior. So being not racist, I'm not racist. I'm not doing X, Y, Z. You're not doing anything. It's just a term. I'm not racist. If you are anti you are practicing what you preach. Um, being anti-racism, being anti-homophobia, uh, transphobia, anti-ableism, you know, ableism, all of these things, you're actively engaging in what you preach, what you practice, you are integrating it into your life. So I encourage folks to be anti and not non. Um, thank you, Ducky. Nation first language is the preferred thing amo amongst indigenous co uh, communities nowadays. I appreciate that. Just like as an example, it'd be like uh, like when you're talking about a specific nation or like a uh, what the, that group of nations calls themselves. Sort of like the same idea as like race first or that we're, we're being um, as correct as we can be and giving them a full autonomy towards, you know, how they want to be addressed and what they want to be called. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, so I want to ask really quickly, and I'm just going to have folks put them in the chats. We all come in with our identities. So if you are familiar with the different types of identities, let me share my screen really quickly. Um, we have identities that may be intersecting. We have different aspects of our identities. And John Hopkins put together a... Um, a wheel of identity. If you've seen it, oh, where did it go? If you've seen it, it's it's actually pretty cool. Um, I enjoy this model because it has. I mean, everybody can find themselves on it. Um, here we go. Um, So this is John Hopkins University, and they did this model of identity. Oh, of course I did that. To show the different types of identities. 
when we have interactions with anyone, um, we bring certain things into the room. So everybody's bringing an identity of sorts into this room. This model is a way to understand group identities and recognize the individuals, but also recognize what I am bringing into the room as an individual and how that may affect the other person who's going to have a different identity. So as I'm sitting here, I, uh, you know, I present as Black, African American, African, depending on who you ask. I'm actually, if you ask for my ethnicity, my dad is from Haiti. I am 40 something, uh, identify as a female, and uh, I am queer. I have mental, physical disabilities, and so on and so forth. So just quickly in the chat, I'd like if folks could put what they are bringing into the room and kind of center that as we go along. I'm not gonna read it out loud, but I want folks to notice who else is in the room here as we're having these discussions. Um, it really helps shape some of the way, well, it helps shape inter interpersonal interactions, but it also helps shape the way that we view the world when we understand that there are people who are different from us in here. Um, let me give, let me put that back up and give folks a moment to look at it and just a minute, just type in what you are bringing into the room today and who you are representing. Okay. Thank you for those who are able to put something in the chat. Before we move on, do we have any questions? Okay. So I do want to share, I'll have a couple of videos to share, but I want to talk about why we have biases. Has anybody taken a class that talks about why we have biases? You can just do a raise of hand. If you've had any class that talks about biases and why we have biases. All right, a couple. Good, that's glad to know. So I won't go ahead into what a bias is and why we have them other than to say that stereotypes, biases, and discrimination are kind of the continuum that we work off of. Stereotypes are simplified beliefs that we build upon for biases and biases are perceptions of favor. Discrimination is really the act, the act of exclusion, the act of inclusion based on someone's identity and our beliefs about those identities. What I want to talk about is where do these come from? So the brain is really intricate. And I'm gonna nerd out for a sec because um, this part to me is so interesting. And I will go ahead and share some of this presentation with you all afterwards. So you can have access to the sli any slides and stuff I bring up. Um, 11 million pieces of information comes in every second to our bodies. So that is our sensory memory. Right now, if you stopped and thought about it, you can feel the clothes that you're wearing. You can hear the sounds around you. Sometimes you can feel, you know, the breeze if you have a fan going on in your room. But if you take a moment and you really scan, you'll notice that there's so much information coming in all the time. It's 
takes a little bit of awareness, but if you did a full body scan just from head to toe, what am I feeling? I am feeling my veil. I am feeling my long sleeves. My, I have to admit, I'm wearing Crocs and PJ pants under this thick guardy. I'm feeling the chair underneath. I'm feeling the grounds. I'm feeling, you know, X, Y, Z. 11 million pieces of information come into our brains every second. Of those 11 million, only 40 to 50 are screened in as relevant. That is a tiny, tiny chunk. That's a lot of information coming in that our brain has said, no, I don't need to know this. I don't need to pay attention to this. I'm going to put that and file that away. Out of the 40 to 50, only five to nine pieces of information are actively attended to. So if you've ever been driving down a road and notice that all of a sudden you're home, that's because our brains choose to pay attention to certain things, certain relevant things. So whether it's for our safety, whether it's in a class and you're learning how to you know, do something new, our brain tends to focus on things that are novel, that are new, that stand out. But we're talking 11 million pieces of information coming in through all of our senses that go down to five to nine. So our brains take that information and put it into categories. So it'll say, you know, well, this is a smell. I don't need to know that. This is this. this is, I don't need to know that. And it'll store it all away. Um, and it does this automatically. This is just part of how the brain works. And I do want to show a little bit of a clip. If you've seen this, hope, hopefully you haven't seen this. Hopefully this is absolutely new. Um, this is a, a little clip from a show that is about, um, it, oh, I may need some help with some of the sharing, but um, this is a show that's about the, let's see this. I'm hoping this will have sound. We can see it at least, so that's a start. Okay, that's a start. Let me try. Is it coming up full screen for y'all? No, I'm just see. Uh, I'm seeing um, PowerPoint stuff around it, and now it's full screen. Okay, let me see. Okay, I'm hoping that this will work. Really, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Whilst I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> Did you know, madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Why not? It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. How many changes did y'all notice? If anybody noticed anything at all? None at all. And can we oh. get the link to that? Yes, I will. I will put that in um, the 
probably in the recording or I'll have y'all email me, but absolutely. So let me see if I can pull it up. I definitely Anyone? only got like one or two, but it, it, and I thought that they weren't, I was sort of unconscious about it. Like I, I didn't think that I wasn't sure that they were changes. If that makes sense. I kind of gaslit myself a little. I was just like, no, that yeah. didn't really change. Did it? Anyone else? I noticed changes, but I didn't keep track. I didn't count. I didn't really notice that changes were happening. I was focusing on the plot. Yeah, same. So I remember I uh, when I first watched that, I was really looking for signs to figure out who did it. I was so excited to be able to say at the end, like, I did it. I know who did it. I know who did it. I got nothing. I didn't see a single change. Nothing, you know, clicked in my brain whatsoever. That is, again, because we have these sensory things. We have all of this stuff that is coming into our brains, five to nine that we are focused on. So if you're already focused on, I want to find out who did it and look for those clues, right? Your pulled attention, your attention is pulled away. It's only through active attention that we can see those types of things. This is just, oh, sorry. This is just how our brains work. Um, I think the interesting thing about that video is I, I, I'm telling you, like I've seen it several times every time I teach this class and I still don't catch everything. And it's still frustrating as hell because I want to see those things, but I put the, the clip in the chat, go back and kind of take a look at it again. Now, you know, there's 21 changes, you know, kind of where the changes are, go back and like pay attention, say, I'm going to pay attention to the rug and see if I can spot the change. I'm going to pay attention to this piece, right? Attention does matter. And again, our brain is pull, pulling different pieces of what we're watching, different focus of what we're watching. And that happens every day. It happens every day. Really what this looks like when it comes to um, bias is that our brain stores these emotions, these, um, okay, sorry, thank you so, for reposting that. Our brains take an event. So when we're born, we have not put sensations to, to and emotions into what we've seen, right? An event happens based on our experiences of the event, we assign an emotion, we assign a feeling, we have thoughts, our cognitive processes go, oh, here's this event, here's what happened, here's what I think about it, I'm gonna store that information for later. This is due to the way that we evolved to assess threats. So if you think about it, if someone had to stop and think, is this animal, this furry animal with really long teeth, are they dangerous to me? Could I pet it? I kind of want to have it as a pet. Let's see if I can get, you know, yada, yada, yada. They may not have ancestors that, <laughs> that are living today. Our brains adapted to be able to say, I'm going to put this in the threat column for now and then make a decision later based on what the outcome is, for example. These cognitive processes happen without us even being aware. It is just something that has developed to be alive. It's a survival mechanism. Unfortunately, what happens is a lot of those emotions, especially if they're strong, can override our memory. So if I have an experience with someone who looks different than me, and it is um, something that is unpleasant, that unpleasantness based with the generalities of the person may take stronger hold in my memory than any of the actual facts of what happened. When my brain later goes back to access that information, say I see someone who looks similar, it does this cardex file looking for, I know this happened, there's similar experiences, how do I feel about this? They have something to pull up, but it's tied with an emotion and not the facts. Our brains often get this wrong, which is where the biases come into play. So I'm going to give another one, for instance. Um, 
when I first went to high school, so in all of my schooling, I've been one of like six black people. Um, when I went to, when I was in high school, um, there was a, another person of color who was very outspoken, who was very, um, walked down the middle of the halls and very confident in who she was. And I was not, I was the complete polar opposite, wanted to melt into everything. But I noticed after a while, after seeing her, I was like, I don't want to be like her because the experiences she was having that I was witnessing mm -hmm. were negative. She was being ostracized. She was being picked on. And I, being a person of color in this white world, did not want that to happen to me. And I started noticing these negative thoughts. I later had to go back and unlearn those thoughts. Now, being in high school, wanting to just fit in and not be noticed, um, it wasn't until I got to college where it was like, you know, I wish I had that. I wish I had been that person. I wish I could stop caring about what other people think. I wish I had been her friend and been like, hey, I admire you for being who you are in your genuine self. I didn't find my genuine self until I started teaching DEI. Uh, my hair, I didn't go natural until five years ago because I was trying to fit in still and fit in in corporate world. And those biases stayed with me. When I saw women like her, I thought, oh, I don't want to be there because then I'm going to be in this atmosphere and people are going to lump me in. Um, it's really hard to talk about and really hard to admit that these things happened. And again, the biases are part of life. The worst thing you can do is not understand your biases. The second worst thing, or I should say more wor worse than that, is to act on our biases. That's when we really start to see the problems within the society. That's where we start to see the harms. So again, the biases, not good, not bad, they are. They're there for survival mechanism. As a matter of fact, there's a podcast um, that I watched that was beautifully written and beautifully done about the fact that the moment we see something different and just something different, when our mind automatically goes into threat assessment mode, it dumps a bunch of chemicals in our bodies because it's getting ready for fight or flight as it's making that an assessment. And it's happening faster than that. It is an immediate kind of thing. So it's assessing rolodexing through and then deciding what to do. Am I going to run? Am I going to stay? Am I going to faint? Am I going to fight, right? We have our senses. It's instinctual. Our brains make mistakes. They make mistakes processing the information. They make mistakes storing the information and it makes mistakes pulling the information out later. I did want to give folks an opportunity to share if something, uh, you know, if you had a bias for a long time that you realize later you were was problematic and if you work to change that or you know how you dealt with that moving forward or if you're sitting here and you're like oh shit that's me now what i'm going to open this one to hands and i'll have uh dustin or ducky if you could call on anyone who raises hands Uh, yeah, K, uh, KR uh, is raising his hand. Yeah, um, I had a bias that was um, rooted in something I don't even remember anymore. And it took, it was a childhood event. Like I was an infant when I developed the bias, weirdly. And it wasn't until I was seven that I had it pointed out to me and realized why it was a problem that I was so aversive to this very specific demographic of a person that I could not even remember the concern I had with that demographic in the first place, but I just avoided interacting with individuals that matched that type and 
my mother actually had to point it out to me and say, you know, not all of these people are going to be the same as that one person was. Oh, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Uh, Vanny has also um, a bias that they would like to talk about. Um, yeah. So basically, I think a lot of my biases come from kind of just ignorance um, and trying to educate myself because I was raised in a very small nuclear family environment, very uneducated on different issues, raised by racist <laughs> individuals who, you know, maybe didn't say things flat out, but like were roundabout in their way of saying things. Um, and then also just a very exclusionary, like fundamentalist Christian, like homeschooling kind of environment. So like very, very kept, kept in the dark, kept very ignorant. Um, and my journey over the last really seven years has been like consume other cultures. Like I literally had to move to another country to break this cycle. And now I can't even really talk to my parents because I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> um, so a lot of those biases, like I'm just trying to combat them by like consuming other people's cultures and being like, what makes your, like, what makes you guys tick? Like, what do you guys do? Like, I got to get past all this. Uh, thank you for sharing that also. Uh, Kiara also has one. For me, I think uh, one of the biggest biases and, and, and I don't know how, how much of this uh, is a is a bias, but my parents were very much the race blind, middle class white people. And so those are the biases that I, I think I've mostly been trying to confront and break through, you know, after having learned that how really problematic they are to really go from being race blind to, to being anti-racist. Thank you. I know just from my personal perspective, I dealt with my indigenous family was really anti-black uh, because they, I, I can't even say why, I don't know. Uh, but I was raised with a lot of anti-black bias and it wasn't until I chose to be different and I chose to like, because I was being raised in a more urban environment, chose to like think outside of what I was being taught at, at home on the res to not have that sort of anti-black bias. But the other half of my family is white. And so there was a lot of internalized uh, racism and bigotry coming at me like the, the bigotry was coming from me at me inside the house I was simultaneously saying I'm not native enough while exhibiting bigoted behavior towards the black community <laughs> is a it's a real mind mess no thank you for sharing that yeah, thank you all for sharing it's not easy and I, I I really appreciate when people give their own experiences um so bias, and I want to be very, very clear to everyone who's in here, and please feel free to pass it along. Bias, hate, bigotry, discrimination, it happens from all walks of people. Like this is not something that oh, only white people can be biased. Some of the people that I've worked with trying to do DEIB work, both in and outside of the SCA, have been other, other folks of color. Um, no one is above this. And again, biases are rooted in our brain processes. Hate is a whole other topic uh, that I don't necessarily want to address here because that is getting into the extremes. But we all do microaggressions. Uh, I did, I, I've done this presentation type of presentation in my career I don't know, six years now. And for the first three, no one told me about in my presentation, I kept saying blind spots. That's ableist language. I am someone who can't see without glasses and have different abilities. And I continuously said blind spots. We do these things. The difference is we don't 
act on them or we shouldn't be acting on them because then we're starting to get into a different realm it comes from everyone and we all can do better i'm making the assumption today that everyone in here or anyone attending this uh collegium wants to do better but it can come from anyone no one is immune to it the difference is especially in the sea is that we need to start breaking down communication we can no longer say that um you know this be someone gives me feedback i'm going to shut down and be um you know i'm, I'm going to shut down and be defensive i don't want to talk to this person they just don't understand me because learning doesn't happen that way and i'll talk a little i'll, I'll talk about bringing how to bring people along instead of shutting down conversations on the other hand we have to be willing to give that feedback. Yes, often the burden happens on those from marginalized communities. And unfortunately, until folks are further along in their journey, that may be the case. Will it always have to be the case? No, and there are ways and a whole other class about how people from marginalized communities can help other people do the work themselves. But in general, yeah, we're gonna have to help other people learn along the way. And there are dangers inherent in being a person from a marginalized community, just going and saying, can I talk to you about this? Cause it didn't feel good, but we got to start changing the culture from bad versus good binary and move it into a place of let's break down communication where we can accept feedback as well as give feedback in a way that brings people along. DEI work is a constant learning and growing atmosphere. Like it does not stop. Like I had talked about, you know, before in the queer community, all I knew was LGBTQ. And now we are recognizing more identities as more identities come out and say, here I am, as people figure out who they are and where they fit and have new language for it. Um, I am constantly, as I work with people in, uh, you know, from diverse backgrounds, I'm constantly learning and I'm constantly making mistakes. Um, it happens. I am constantly listening to folks say, well, I'm, I don't look like a person of color, so I'm not. And I'm constantly having those discussions because, you know, I don't understand. Help me understand why you're not a person of color, but you are. These conversations have to happen. They may be uncomfortable, but they need to happen. And before we move on, I, I did want to show another video because, again, as I said in the beginning, most of what you will encounter in the SCA in the real world are microaggressions. They're not going to be the huge, you know, uh, uh, clan rally out your window. These are going to be the small slights that tell someone you don't quite belong here or you are different. Um, if you've seen this video, it's one of my favorites. I always love to show it because it is so important to understand what these are and they are complicated microaggressions are complicated but it's the first very first step in what is called bystander intervention for people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem oh you're so well spoken. Oh, just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. Oh. Mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while, no, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland. Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date. Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I guess I am. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the rest of kids safe. Part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <laughs> I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. You know, John, I'm stopping it by oh, I'm scared too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. 
touch your hair multiple times a day. It seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. A mosquito bite, who cares? Just another angry black one. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try with challenging major. Oh, other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like he was up to trouble, okay? I felt threat. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggressions. Uh, that video has always been a powerful one for me um, because I've experienced a lot of those microaggressions. Um, It is, it is difficult to talk about microaggressions when you experience them and when you experience them so frequently. Unfortunately, I've also experienced a lot of these in the SCA as we're a microcosm. But this is what you're going to notice more often. And I will give resources. Um, I have an entire sheet that kind of outlines the, the uh, kind of breadth of microaggressions, the common ones, what and what they communicate because there's, there's the message of, oh, you speak great English. Uh, and that message is actually saying like, it is clear you're not from here and you're so educated and so you speak English. And so I will offer that as a resource as well. Um, I will, let me share this link in here. I just find it, I find it really powerful. Um, and it's something that I like to share often. Okay. Any thoughts that came up with that one? I saw some comments if someone wants to read those off. The comments that I'm seeing are that there was other people's favorite video. Like Bella said, it was one of her favorites as well. And Vanny said, it's another great video that really puts it in perspective. It really is. It's hard to understand microaggressions, especially if you don't experience them. Um, but they happen. They happen all the time. So... I want to move on to, let me see, where did I go? Really, when we're talking about bias, it influences the way that we view the world around us, whether we know it or not. Explicit, you know, explicit biases are ones that people are generally aware of, but it's the implicit biases that really get us. And so there are places where you can take some tests uh, project implicit is one of those, and I'll have some um, information uh, for you at the end or probably um, in the recording. So y'all can, you know, kind of scope that out. But I want to really emphasize that we're not looking for, we're often not looking for the big aggressive aggression. Um, we're looking for those you know, subtle, subtle microaggressions, the biases that happen. Um, okay. Before we start this next part, because I'm really, this is where uh, we're going to talk about the interventions. I'm going to highlight two specifically, because when we're talking about calling along, calling alongside, there are some interventions that are more successful than others. However, there is a group that was holler back, holler back. They are now right to be, and I'll put uh, the link when I share the resources that coined the five D's of bystander intervention. Um, and we have a couple of those that work for certain situations better, some that work for other uh, situations better. The reason I wanna highlight a couple is because I really want folks to focus on the bringing alongside. Um, and let me stop and talk about the bringing al alongside, calling alongside. So there is, uh, you may have heard the terms calling out, calling in. So calling out culture, people tend to think of the uh, more aggressive. What are you doing? You need to stop that. You need an X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, which tends to bring uh, people, the people who are doing the, um, you know, microaggression or the behaviors 
tends to cause uh, feelings of, and you know, feelings of inferiority tend to make people feel bad, tend to close people down. There is a place to call people out. Absolutely. There are situations where calling out is the most appropriate thing we can do, especially if someone is high um, in, in, in danger, really. Or, you know, I think about the sexual harassment, um, any sort of racial identity harassment, a whole gamut of things. There are times where if it's unsafe, we call it out because we need the behavior to stop. And we know that if we call out, we are not likely going to have those opportunities to teach. Um, calling in culture is something that was more, I don't wanna say more recently developed, but was really about centering people from marginalized communities as the work is being done. So making sure that it's not about making the perpetrator uh, or the aggressor or what have you, it's not about them, it's about the well-being of the marginalized folks. I've also found in that, that we still kind of uh, shut down conversations and learning. So I, I practice calling alongside. Now I can do that because I am used to being the teacher. I'm used to saying, hey, well, this happened, this is how it comes across, this is how people are feeling, and here's something you can do next time. That is the space that I operate in. That is not for everyone. Um, and it's it's definitely not for marginalized folks to have to do that. And it is the way that I have been successful in this work. I work for a large state agency and the state that I'm working in. Um, and that is how I have found to be the most comfortable and the most um successful. But calling alongside, the reason I like the calling alongside, hold on a sec. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Calling alongside opens doors for communication. So I want to show, I think, one more video to demonstrate why bystander intervention which is it, quite literally bystander intervention is meant to um, stop something in progress that is harmful. Um, why it's so important. Oops, how do I get out of that? Let's see. This is one of my other favorite videos. My sister-in-law, uh, who's half black, half white, but looks white, blue eyes, whiter than most white folks, very white. Uh, she and I, you know, we kind of grew up together. We raised our children together. Uh, so they're first cousins. And we, you know, it's a wonderful, very, very multicultural family. So we're going in a safe way one day. And um, Kathleen, my, my sister-in-law is in front of me. <laughs> She's, uh, you know, writing a check for her girl. Now, my daughter, who at the time was 10 years old, was standing with me, and I was directly behind her, you know, getting ready to get my groceries. So Kathleen comes up, and the checker, who is a strawberry blonde, um, freckled, very delightful, warm, um, you know, the checker, this young woman, is talking to Kathleen. Hey, how are you doing? It's a nice day today. They're just chatting up. And she gets, so Kathy writes her, her check, and she steps off to the side with her groceries because she's waiting for me. Once again, Kathleen looks white, right? So I come up. No conversation. She looks up at me. Absolutely no, just a little chatter. And uh, I write my check. My daughter, however, can notices immediately the difference in how she responds to me. So I write my check, and she goes, I'm going to need two pieces of ID. At which point, my daughter looks at me, and she gets very, very embarrassed, and tears are, are, are kind of coming up in her eye, like, Mommy, you're not going to you're not going to let her do this. Why is she doing this to us, right? So I'm trying to figure out what I should do because behind me are two elderly white women. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay. So then I become the angry black woman, <laughs> and they're going to be. And I just, I'm, I'm just trying to second guess all the drama. So then I, I just give her the two pieces of ID. I say, you know, some things you got to choose your battles, right? And then it gets worse. She pulls out the bad check. So the, this is the book that shows the people who have written bad checks. So she starts searching 
for my license in the bad check, at which point it's just out of control now. Just as I'm standing there um, trying to decide what to do, and it's really deeply humiliating, and now my, my daughter is just full-blown emotionally upset, she's pissed, my sister-in-law walks back over, and she steps in and she says, excuse me, why are you doing this? And the checker goes, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean? She goes, why are you taking her through all of these changes? Why are you doing that? She goes, well, um, this is our policy. She goes, no, it's not your policy because you didn't do that with me. Oh, well, I know you. You've been. She goes, no, no, she's been here for years. I've only lived here for three months. And so at this point, the two white elderly ladies go, oh, I can't believe what this checker is doing with this woman. It's totally unacceptable. At which point, the manager walks over. So the manager walks over and says, is there a problem here? And then my sister-in-law again responds. She goes, yes, there is a problem here. Here is what happened. So you see, she used her white privilege. And even though Kathleen is half black and half white, she recognizes what that means. And she made the statement. She pointed out the injustice. And she, as a result of that one act, influenced everyone in that space. But what would have happened? I can't know for certain had the black woman said, this is unfair. Why are you doing this to me? Would it have had the same impact? But Kathleen knew that she walked through the world differently than I did. And she used her white privilege to educate and make right a situation that was wrong. That's what you can do every single day. That, that is another one of my favorite movies or videos uh, when I'm talking about um, uh, microaggressions and bystander intervention. Um, her name is just went off the top of my head, but she has a lot of amazing books on anti-racism. Um, she does a book that's specific for people of color and how um, slavery continues to show up in everyday lives. But, you know, the person, her sister-in-law, probably did something that would be uncomfortable for all those folks, uh, for most folks. And so I do want to share a couple things. So one, when we think about bystander intervention, and this is, I, I want to be very clear that bystander intervention is hard to do. Um, and I know that. But statistics show that only 25% of people that were surveyed in uh, by Hollaback, only 25% of people reported someone stepped in to intervene. However, 79% of people who had someone intervene said it was helpful. Most people want an intervention. And for me, I would rather intervene or have someone intervene and later say, hey, I didn't necessarily you know, want that, I didn't need that, what have you. But that's an important thing to keep in mind is most people don't intervene. And it's because people are afraid, people are afraid of you know, being called out, people are afraid that uh, you know, they fear for their own safety, they fear judgment from peers, they're unsure if assistance is needed. We assume that others will engage, assume someone's more qualified or feel like we don't have a lack of skills. There are many reasons why people don't, uh, that people don't tend to intervene, but so important when we do. So kind of the last slide I want to go over. Uh, is just a brief overview of the interventions. I will have, uh, I will give folks the link to all this information, which includes their free, let's see, their free trainings. Okay, are the six Ds showing? Yes, yes yeah. they are. Okay, so direct, so there there are all of these Ds of bystander intervention, and these have been proven time and time again. They were developed for if you are, are a person out, you know, just in the general public and you see something, how to act, 
and how to intervene. I can tell you I've used these in the workplace. I've used them at home. I've used them with friends, with family. They apply everywhere. Um, I'm not going to go into depth on these because, like I said, the Holla Back, who is now uh, right to be, gives free trainings on this. Um, but you have the direct response, which is what most people think of when they say, let's intervene. The direct response is that you need to stop this. Or, you know, the in a lot of ways, people see it as the more aggressive. It doesn't have to be. It could be as simple as, well, what did you mean by that? I don't understand that joke. Can you help me understand? But ten, people tend to use that from what I've seen and experienced in a way that turns people off from engaging in the opportunity to learn later. I tend to use more of the uh, distract or delay. So I tend to uh, distract by diffusing a situation. So it's like, hey, I see those two are getting in a fight. Let's bring someone over here. Hey, you have a phone call or, hey, we need to go to this next event just to diffuse the situation and get the person who is being harmed away. Um, and I will later, and this is where the delay comes in, later ask if I can talk to the person who did the harm. Um, delay really is about waiting until the situation is done and then going back to talk to someone and delegate, lucky for us, we have our seneschals, we have our um, you know, event stewards, we have a whole litany of people that we can ask to help us interfere, interfere. The debrief and document are really, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, you know, have, if you're going to do, if something harmful happens, write it down. You may need it later. And the debrief is let's talk to the person who was harmed about what happened and do they want help um i'll leave this up as a second hey john uh, we have vanny has yeah. a question uh do you yeah. think it would be helpful to ask if someone would uh someone would like me to intervene before intervening so these are designed mostly to you don't have the opportunity to necessarily intervene now you may so you may be sitting in a class and you may be you know something was said to ducky i might send a message hey ducky i just heard that do you want me to are, are you okay if i say something or it's after the fact hey i really want to go talk to that person i saw what happened is that okay if i go talk to you um there's always opportunity to do that the in the moment there often isn't so you see something harmful happening we often don't have the ability to like stop the person unless you can pull them away and say, hey, do you want me to intervene? It's always a great idea to ask, but I'm on the side of better safe than sorry. And you'll know if someone's uncomfortable, you see the body language, the closed body language, pulling away, the nervous laughter, people get itchy. So signs that our blood is moving and our, our body is going through these fight or flight as we get itchy. Um, so we don't always have that opportunity, but if you do, yes. The other thing to do is just intervene and afterwards say, hey, I didn't that I didn't think that was safe for you. It didn't seem safe. It didn't seem like you're comfortable. Was that okay that I did that? Most people, like I said, 76% of the people are going to say, yeah, that was helpful. I'm of the mind that I tend to diffuse the situation. So distract by bringing the victim away and then saying, hey, what can I do for you now? What do you need? And then going back and, and saying, I'm, I'm going to speak to this person. Um, I'm not going to speak on your behalf, but what I saw is unacceptable. Um, and it's easy to do in some cases. The other one that's easy to use at, at when people are inebriated or substances are in call is distract. People who are inebriated under, you know, intoxified for whatever reason are easily distracted. Um, I went to a concert mundanely where a guy who clearly, um, I work with people with disabilities, uh, cognitive disabilities, developmental disabilities most of my life. And I recognized some of the tilt on sign. He had no spatial awareness whatsoever, but these girls were very uncomfortable. And so I went up to him. I said, hey, you having fun? How about we go dance over here? And I just kind of spun him around and we moved to another place and he got to enjoy the concert and they didn't feel uncomfortable. It can be as simple as that. It could be as simple as, you know, using the distraction. It can be as simple, I'm making eye contact 
with the victim to let them know they're watching. I have, most people I know have had, you know, been in a situation at a bar that's uncomfortable and I've had random people go up, oh, hey, sis, how you doing? Why don't we go get a drink over there, right? Those things work. Um, there's a, there was a whole story about a guy in New York City who ate Doritos in the middle of a fight on a bus and that's all that needed, right? So there are a lot of simple ways that we can do it. Um, I encourage folks to take the training because I know we're running out of time, but it doesn't have to be this grand thing. My favorite is, is I don't understand. Can you tell me more about that? Like, I don't understand that joke. What do you mean? Or, um, you know, telling people, hey, you have, uh, uh, we need to get to this next class and then pulling them away. Center the victim, but if we can, educate and make aware. Um, it looks like we are close to running out of time. So I did want to we pause. Have, what? We have 12 more, we have 12 more minutes. Yeah, so I did want to pause and just, uh, open it up for questions. We can go to an overspill. I plan on doing my full bystander intervention piece class on voices of color, which is where I do my hosting as well as other classes. So if you really want to catch that, that'll be coming probably in February. But I just wanted an overview of things that we need to do first, breaking down the biases, making communication happen, and getting the ball rolling. And that's how we bring people up, people along. So questions, open discussion. If you could raise your hands, please, though. No questions at all. Everybody feels comfortable? I had a question, but I uh, I didn't know how to address myself since I'm helping mo moderate. I don't know. Um, when we're talking about uh, debriefing and documenting, are there better ways of doing are there prefer not preferred baby are there more helpful ways of doing it than other ways because a lot I find myself a lot of times when I'm trying to debrief other people or document other people or document what has happened to other people um I fall into the trap of like taking their side almost like especially when I'm trying to do the debrief mm -hmm. of like so taking their of taking that side and, and be and, and having that umbrage with them and that is very easy to do. Um, one of the things that when I do the full training talk about is you, you document the facts. Um, if you're documenting facts, then it's easier to keep the emotions out. When you debrief, that is where the emotions can come in. That is where you can say, I was re-traumatized by that. But the facts are this person said or did this, this is what happened next. And that's how I keep the two separate. So the documentation, this, now I work for the state, so keep that in mind, but the documentation can be a legal document. Feelings and emotions are not helpful if there's an investigation. The facts are the investigation. That is what we document. The emotions are in the debrief. You can take the side. Like there's nothing wrong with taking the side. When we think about harm in the society, when one person is harmed, the community is harmed. That's why I will also be doing a class on restorative justice. It's not just about saying sorry to this one person. It's saying sorry to the community that was harmed. So I think overall, when you document, use facts, when you debrief, it's okay to pick a side. It's okay to feel swayed one way or the other. Leonard has a question, and then we have a question in chat. Hello? We, yes, can, we hear can hear you now. You, okay. Um, I have an autism spectrum disorder, Sukareva syndrome. I am incapable of reading social cues. So I tend not to intervene because I'm afraid I'm misreading the situation. Um, I don't know what to do about that because there's been occasions when I very much thought intervention was needed, but I was afraid that I was reading things wrong and would get into trouble. So there is another fail safe kind of thing that you can do. 
if you see something is happening and you think that someone may be in trouble and they're having a conversation, feel free to go up to them and be like, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? Is everything okay? And just ask that question. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now you may get someone go, yeah, why? And maybe you can catch them later, but I don't, going up to someone and saying, hey, are things okay? Are you okay? It looks like you were distressed. I don't see any problem with that. Uh, we can't control the actions or the reactions of other people, but I think it's perfectly acceptable to do that. And if they say, you know, yes, I I want to leave this conversation, then you have like specific actions you can do next. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We did have a question in chat. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, it just bounced. Let me find it again. Bella's question in chat. Yeah. Uh, do you have um, the thoughts? Or yeah, do you have the thoughts about the best way to document within the SCA? I'm always happy to handle things in the moment, but I always don't always know how to create long-term change in this space. So documenting an incident, I literally use the who, what, where, when, why, how. Um, when I meet with folks, so there's a couple of things. So that is what we need for an investigation. As someone who is watching, I may put in a section that says, and I've had to, I've had to do this many times, unfortunately, a section that says, here is what a repar reparation could look like. Here's how they could repair it. And here are some things that, that could, they could do differently next time. Because it's not enough to say, hey, you did something wrong. If they don't know what's wrong, that's great. We give them the education. But how will they change if we don't let them know what other options are available? Bella has an additional clarification to this question. What is uh, the best way to find out who should receive these types of reports? Gotcha. Um, so it's never it's never a problem to start with your local group. If you're in, if you're at an event, starting with the event steward Seneschal, um, I tend to seek counsel from peers that I know who uh, have been in longer. Um, but there is no wrong way to report it or wrong place to report it. We do have our bullying and harassment policy. I know there are flaws with that, but there are things that you can go through. Um, I've also had such extreme ones that I've written the bot and then CC'd the Kingdom Seneschal and said, here's why I'm going over to straight to you. Um, if you. If you are comfortable with your local group, they can help you determine who would best navigate that situation. If you're not, go to your Kingdom Seneschal. My only additional advice there is if you're not comfortable with your kingdom seneschal, just keep moving it up to keep moving it up the chain, no matter what you got to do. And it might take a lot of energy and it might take a lot of time uh, as somebody who's had to do that themselves be because they didn't feel comfortable in their local area or their local kingdom. But uh, it is still worth reporting. It is somebody still needs to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, to wrap up, I'm going to show one more uh, video. Because I am all, I don't know if anybody else is, but I'm a very visual learner. Um, and this is my favorite bystander video that I just happened to stand upon, uh, just happened to uh, find as I was, let's see, as I was researching for these types of presentations. We're not getting any sound. Yeah, that's what I was I was unmuting to say the same thing. We're not getting any sound. Or can Jean Viev not hear us? What? We're not getting any sound. 
Oh, that helps. Uh, there we go. Share sound. Let's try that again. Just back up a little bit. Good now? Yes, we're good now. Not okay. <clears throat> six with me i mean hardly any words were said at all um and so those those interventions always they feel easier and they're just simple right? they literally kind of put themselves in between what was happening and the person who looked um, really uncomfortable and and probably wanted that intervention um is there anything else Okay, on that note, uh, there's five minutes until the next classes start. So please, thank you uh, for coming and listening. And I hope that y'all can look out for the Voices of Color classes that are going to be starting up probably next, next month. And I wanna thank uh, Dustin and Ducky for helping me. I, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thanks for backing me up, Ducky. That was awesome. Team moderator teamwork makes the moderator dream work, Dustin. <laughs> there we go. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah, I'll stop the recording now.